thank you. Uh, th th thank the, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and you for the attention and Unfortunately, I'm not going to, into my project. I will stay on the topic of GMOs and the public perception and, and stuff like this. Uh, so, uh, what the term genetically modified organism actually means, where it comes from. Uh, it is not very used by scientists. It's basically, it's virtually used by only by politicians, marketers, activists. Uh, because it's unprecise. It's not very precise. Every, as we heard before, uh, all our crops are modified, genetically modified one way or the other. So uh, usually if public says GMO, they actually mean transgenic organism. Uh, organism which, take, which has one, two, three genes uh, borrowed from uh, different organism, transferred by some relatively sophisticated, but usually not natural way. Uh, so uh, the transgenosis is a uh, breeding method. It's not that new. It has been around since mid 80s. So it's kind of surprising why it's so uh, controversial. Uh, so, where exactly you can encounter transgenic organism or GMO organisms? So, for about 20, 30 years, you will find them in basically any biology lab. Uh, they are used for most of the basic medical research, biology research, and nobody really cares about it. Time to time, you see these fancy pictures in the newspapers green pigs, green mouse, green cats, green something. People say, oh, what these scientists do, that's crazy, but they don't really care. Uh, you, can, you can find products of transgenic organism in most of modern uh, medicines. Uh, starting from insulin, which, is be, which has been around since 78, 79, to uh, vaccines, antibodies, anti-cancer drugs. Again, nobody really cares about this application. Uh, then you can find uh, lots of uh, food additives made by GM bacteria. Uh, enzymes, vitamins, nutrients. And it seems that the general public either doesn't know about this application or they just don't care. If it's made in large fermenter and put into cheese, meat, soft drink, nobody really cares. And the only application where, it, where the use of transgenic organism is somehow controversial is in agriculture. And we can try to figure out why is that. Uh, so one reason why is it, apart from uh, scientific research or medicines, food is somehow special. If you, if you have seen lately uh, a TV ad on food, and next to it there was a TV ad on new cell phone or car or something, the advertisement always says, our car is loaded with the newest technology. It's the best car ever made. Uh, super duper everything new. If, if you compare it with the advertisement for food, our cheese was made exactly the same way as our grandfathers did it 200 years ago. Food is different. People take uh, food as a cultural thing. They don't choose the food rationally. You can do a small test in your mind. If you have a choice to uh, drink a glass of uh, water from pure water somewhere in the forest, where you have no knowledge what is upstream, if there is a farm, if there is a water treatment facility, uh, a house with no cleaning and running everything into the water. So you have no, no way of knowing if it's contaminated, if it's deadly, or what's inside. 
and next to it you will get glass of water, which is with health, cert health certificate, but it has been recycled. Somebody already used it once, it has been cleaned and recycled. So if you have that knowledge, 80% of people will choose the so-called so natural, fresh water with just, they will take the risk. So there is, in food, there is something called yuck factor. People don't, don't choose rationally. If we were rational, we would eat insects. It's the best source of protein, nutrients, but that doesn't really play very well in Western society, this idea. So, uh, basically that's the same thing uh, as I said before. Uh, the activists know that food is different from anything else. And they target the population with emotional message. Something is messing up with our food and they don't tell you about it. And on the other side, you have scientists who keep saying, this food is safe, we have these facts, we have statistics, it doesn't make any, anybody sick. But uh, the public doesn't see, see any benefit of the GM food. All the benefit is already consumed by the farmers. So since there is no benefit and there is at least small perceived risk in it, nobody really wants to take the risk. So the only chance how this can change is if somebody will come with better tomato or some fruit which will taste 10 times better or which will become just cool and then nobody will really care if it's GM or not. So how, how, how the fear is being fabricated or, 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 or made? Uh, usually it starts with the GMOs or, or with, with the uh, non-governmental non organization activists like Greenpeace and similar. They are very good in making complex issues into very short messages. And so, so they, let's say, use these spacesuits, uh, combine it with the pictures of tomato fish or some crazy corn. And they usually don't tell you uh, exactly what's wrong with it. They say, it, GM food might be toxic. It might give you cancer based on some very distant evidence. And usually, they take it out of the context. Usually, if they have some evidence, it's applicable, applicable to all food of that category. So, for example, all potatoes contain toxins. But they would tell you, GM potatoes might have increased level of solanin or something. And since they specifically target only one uh, specific case of breeding, your brain will make the message inside. That's how we are wired. Uh, and the message you have inside of your brain is regular potatoes is a safe, are safe. GM and potatoes are not safe. Mm. And uh, although the, the, this message is being spread by NGOs, they are not the only ones who benefit from that message. If Greenpeace were the only benefic benefiting organization, most likely we will not have the controversy of, about GM food anymore. But there is a huge business which is benefiting from the fear So again, we have seen it already before in the previous talks. There is a, if, if you ask 10 people in the public, 
Everybody would equal GM crops with some smaller or bigger danger for both consumers and environment. They would say they are toxic, they, are, they, they increase the pesticides used, they are patented, and uh, they are equalized to capitalism and, and all these things. The fact, facts, actually, if, if you look to the facts, you would say that it's exactly the opposite what the, the environmental activists say. <coughs> Most of the, uh, let's say, the one, one large category of current GM crops are the insect-resistant crops, and they actually contain much less toxins than the conventional products. Uh, because they are not being sprayed, and they are not infected with fung fungus. So they contain less cancer uh, cancerogens. Uh, they need less pesticides. So everything is exactly the opposite than what the public believes. So now I have a, a, a small uh, quiz for you. How good you are with identifying uh, GM foods on, on the shelves, so, so you will not uh, fall asleep in my talk. So who of you thinks that if you will go to a uh, grocery store here in Wroclaw, you will be able to get at least one GM food in following categories? So raise your hand if you think you will find GM veg vegetables somewhere in Wroclaw. Yeah. Uh, GM fruit, uh, some uh, bread, uh, dumplings, anything like that. Uh, would you find uh, cheese made with GM something, uh, ingredients? Meat, I mean, in, in this case, uh, meat made from transgenic organisms or transgenic animals. <laughs> Good. Uh, processed foods, soft drinks, oils. Okay, so uh, here are the categories of food which exist on European market and where you can find GM ingredients in them. I, uh, I excluded the vitamins and, and, and uh, the, the products, like these vitamins you, you can't really tell today which were done using GM bacteria and which were done with regular bacteria. So one large category is cheese because all the uh, chemosine, the, the enzyme which is ne necessary to, to, to make cheese, is not being uh, extracted from the stomachs of uh, calves anymore. It's uh, produced by... Uh, yeast or bacteria in large fermenters, and 80-90% of chemosine on European market is recombinant. And the other food you can find sometimes, I haven't seen it in our country for last five or six years, but it doesn't mean it's not present, is soybean oil. There are no vegetables or fruits, GM, on the market in Europe, and will not be in foreseeable future. So, I will probably skip a few slides here because we've seen exactly the same pictures just before. Uh, I, I thought there will be a nice another quiz, but uh, so that's how uh, wild ancestors of common vegetables looked like a couple of thousand years before. That's how they look today. Carrots, banana, I have actually the same species here, corn. Only, only potatoes are slightly different. Uh, never mind. <laughs> and here are the, the methods which have been used in crop breeding since early 2000, uh, 1900. Uh, hybrid seed, uh, mutagens, ionizing radiation, and last but not least, the transgenosis. Nobody really cares about such a wild, unnatural organisms like 
uh, triticale, which is an interspecific hybrid between wheat and uh, uh, barley or something like that. Uh, and nobody really cares. You can even get organic triticale. That's so crazy. Uh, nobody really knows how many genes are upregulated, how many toxins, mutagens, uh, what, whatever happens during that cross, you can get organic triticale. Uh, the same is true about uh, ionizing radiation. I think actually in the early days, Greenpeace wanted to include mutagenesis into the anti-GMO protests, but European Union didn't like it much because uh, all pasta is made from triticum durum, which is the result of mutagenesis, radiation mutagenesis. So all Italian pasta would be uh, proud bearer of the GMO label and nobody would really eat it. <laughs> so they would just tell them, don't go there. Uh, so how we in the lab create transgenic organisms or GM plants? The easiest way is to use the natural pathogenic bacteria. It's called agrobacterium. It creates tumors on, on plants naturally. And it's actually, uh, that's the way how the agrobacterium works. It transfers its own genes into plants and then forces the plants to create uh, compounds which will feed the bacteria. And since uh, putting genes into bacteria is very easy and it has been around since 68 or 72 or something like that, uh, it was it's much easier to transform, to put genes into bacteria and let the bacteria do the rest. And that's actually what we do. Uh, we get uh, clumps of green cells uh, on the Petri dish and a couple of days, weeks or months later, we get individual plants. From each individual transformed cell, we get a whole plant. So it's partially natural process. The only thing which is in unnatural is that we take piece of the DNA out of the bacteria, we put additional genes in there, and then put it back to bacteria. Uh, it seems sophisticated, but uh, the first transgenic crops are actually these sweet potatoes. And these sweet potatoes has been transformed exactly the same way 8,000 years ago by farmers somewhere in America. Uh, and it has been rediscovered only recently that all cultivated varieties of sweet potatoes contain functional transgene, bacterial, several bacterial genes, which has been transferred this way into their genome. And somehow it uh, simplified the domestication, so all domesticated cultivars have that transgene. So what we do today is only slightly improved in efficiency and in scope, but it's nothing new in, in the agriculture. So why is that that the, the, the fear from GMO is here for such a long time? It's been 30 years or 25 years. And the, the, the answer is because money. Everything turns around money in this world. So uh, at least here in, in Europe, there are many groups which benefit directly from fear. Uh, it's the whole European food industry. Some, one way or the other, benefits from fear from GMO. Uh, there is a huge industry which, is, which has been evolved around, around testing. Does it contain GMO? Does it, does, does it not contain GMO? They not only test the final food, but they approve the whole process. Because in many final foods you cannot 
distinguish the food made from GM ingredients from non-GM ingredients. So you need to go to, uh, let's say if you have to put the non-GMO label on milk, you need to know what the cow ate for all her life. And so you need a lot of testing. Every now and then somebody has to come and put a certificate on the table, and the certificate costs money. So the whole process of certification is a nice business. Uh, then obviously there are these NGOs which make money from uh, scared public, and there is an organic food industry which also wants to make sure you don't get cancer if you buy our products. So how, uh, how the European food industry is involved? It's basically, it's probably the largest player on the, in that field. It has two, diff, two goals which go slightly against each other. So one goal is how to import feed from US or Argentina for uh, European animals. Because Europe doesn't produce enough feed for our animals, about 80% of the feed for animals is imported. And all of that is imported from countries which they grow basically only GMOs. So you need to import it, but at the same time you don't want to import competing products. You don't want to import uh, salami from US, you don't want to import chocolate from US, sausages, anything. Just the low value feed. So the, the answer to that is GMO labeling. If you label some GMO food products, let's say those made from starch, made in GM crops, or made with GM oil, foods like that, chocolate, cookies, would have to bear the GMO label and will be not, uh, nobody will buy them. On the other side, uh, you will exclude some products from the labeling. So all animal products from animals, fat, GM, feed, are excluded because nobody will tell the difference. Uh, also the, the enzymes for cheese making, uh, vitamins, etc., are not included in the labeling because European companies are actually very strong with, in making recombinant enzymes. So only basically what the labeling does, all foods or processed food imported from foreign countries need to have that sticker. Domestic foods don't have that sticker. So we don't have import barrier, but label your food. Easy like that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it seems that it's not working anymore because since you don't have that many products on the shelf which have that sticker contains GMO, people are not scared enough. <laughs> so you need to create another sticker which says GMO free. So these are these private, uh, they are not uh, based on some uh, European regulation, they are private certification schemes, all of them slightly different uh, what it covers and what it doesn't cover. Uh, Usually they have lower limits of accidental contamination. The legal limit normally is 0.9%. They have 0.1%. Doesn't make a big difference. Uh, but they exclude also feed for animals, which is very costly because we don't have enough uh, feed for animals. Uh, and it has to be regularly checked and it also ex uh, includes the enzymes and vitamins. Uh, I have find uh, kind of uh, disturbing numbers. I actually don't really trust that uh, the combined cell, that, that's uh, the source of that information is USDA. I don't really know if it's possible that in Germany alone they would sell 200 billion euros 
worth of food with one of these stickers. It would be something like 3,000 euros per person. That sounds kind of too much. But definitely it's more than what Monsanto makes annually on all products they make, and it's not only GM, GM seed. They also sell organic seed and other seeds. And while this GM-free marketing is working very well, let's say in Germany, it doesn't work that well in other countries. Let's say in our country, we have that uh, company which wanted to make they wanted to be a leader in the field, and in 2015, they introduced a yogurt claiming GM, GMO-free. I haven't seen it this year. The, the sticker just disappeared. I asked them several times by phone, by mail, what it actually means on that yogurt, if they really are sure that none of their cows ever ate uh, <laughs> Soybean from Argentina, how, how they test it, if they have their own cows, nobody really answered, ever. So they had some private label with unknown certification scheme, but evidently it didn't work well because people just didn't want to pay extra money for that. Uh, then there is that huge business of testing. Um, but completely unknown to the public, there is a, a company called Global ID, which has several smaller uh, sister or daughter companies, Genetic ID, Food Chain ID, Sight ID. And it's been run by uh, a cult, Maharishi University or Maharishi cult from Fairfield, uh, Iowa. And if it sounds familiar, uh, you probably, uh, that, that guy, Jeffrey Smith, has been mentioned already by both of you or Mark. Uh, that's a, a person who started the, or was instrumental in making GM issue very important in US and probably globally. He wrote several books about how it's, how it's crazy. It's that flying yogi dance instructor with no scientific background. His uh, books are completely crazy. I, bullshit has been said already before, so I, I use different expression. <laughs> but he, he writes these books, he runs around people, and he scares people. And at the same time, his colleagues provide answer. You are scared, we will test your food. Just give me our, your money. Give us a little bit of money and we will be sure that uh, there is no scary ingredients in your food. So these are two sides of the same coin and all is run by, by this cult in, in uh, Iowa. And it, uh, actually, they, they have global sales around $1 billion a year just from the testing. And it's increasing year after year. Uh, here is also something interesting. Something is going on in Europe. Uh, I have introduced something which I called uh, Greenpeace GMO Index, something similar to a Big Mac Index, <laughs> where you compare different countries for the price of Big Mac. Uh, I compared the uh, national website of Greenpeace organizations all over Europe. There are several countries that don't have their national uh, Greenpeace organization. Uh, in most of the countries, uh, anti-GMO campaign is directly on the main web page. It's, it's one of the major campaigns. Uh, so 13 countries have their own anti-GMO Greenpeace campaign. There are four other countries where GMO issue is hidden in a campaign to make uh, agriculture sustainable. So it's not a first issue, it's slightly hierarchically, you have to dig in, in, the, uh, in, in the web 
and see that Greenpeace are also bad. Insecticides are bad, pesticides are bad, and GMOs are also bad. And then we have, then we have seven countries where they don't have any notion that GMO even exists. And I actually have no idea why it's these green countries, Portugal, UK. I can understand in our country people really don't want to spend too much money on food, so it doesn't work that way. But uh, I think similar might be true also for, let's say, Slovakia, Hungary. They also don't want to spend much money on food and Greenpeace for them. If, uh, I actually asked people from Greenpeace, those staffers who you can meet them on bus stations or underground. They ask you for money regularly. And I interviewed a few of them. And they said, actually, people in this country don't like the campaign against nuclear energy, and they don't like campaign against GMO. They said, it's anti-environmentalism. Uh, stop it. And they did. They stopped it. <laughs> so, and, and last, uh, industry which benefits greatly from anti-GMO campaign is the organic industry. But, they are facing a big challenge today. Maybe you have heard something about the CRISPR technology. Uh, it's a newer way how to change genes. Unlike, it's last, last slide. Sorry. Uh, <coughs> uh, so it's, a, um, it's not called uh, transferring gene, but gene editing. You can basically change several bases in the gene code, and it doesn't leave a trace. So the, the nature of changes is exactly the same as what you can get with mutation, uh, radiation mutagenesis, chemical mutagenesis. The only difference is instead of hitting random targets, you hit just one target. And people who are uh, organic breeders really like the technology because they know uh, it can be used for many things, but primarily it can be do, done uh, or used for resistance breeding. Organic farmers need resistant varieties. Without resistant varieties, organic farmers are not competitive. So this is holy grail for organic breeders. This is the guy who is the organic uh, breeder leader in Switzerland, and he said that on public. Shitstorm uh, uh, happened just after that because there is a, another part of the industry, and that's the marketing, certification, production part of the organic industry. And they fear that once this technology is allowed in organic farming, they will not be able to say, pay premium, we will save you from genetic engineering. So, uh, I don't know how it will develop. So, here are my conclusions. Uh, the transgenic or GMO production is just a more precise breeding method, and the method of breeding doesn't have any impact on safety per se. The important part is what is the trade. And the second important conclusion is that while the fear from the GM food is not really rational, it's, it's very rationally used for monetary or, or money benefit. And because there are, is so much gravity on using it, I don't see it will uh, go away anytime soon. And it will be interesting to see why it's working in some countries and not in the others. And that's it. Thank you very much. Sorry for being long.